Hey, welcome back to Way of the Wrench, and on today's video, I'm going to show you how to inspect and repack your wheel bearings and all the little things you need to know to do the job properly and safely. So, let's get going. So today I'm gonna to show you how to do this on a pop-up camper or a tent trailer, but keep in mind, this is the same exact job that you would see on a car or a truck of an older era. So old muscle cars and trucks and things like that, where you have the thrust style bearings, an inner and an outer, all held together on a spindle with a castle nut and a cotter pin. So it should be the same exact job. Now, you do need some tools to do this job, so I'll quickly run through those. Now we are going to have to lift the vehicle off the ground, so you're going to need a hydraulic floor jack, a safety stand and a set of wheel chocks so your vehicle does not move on you. And before we do that, we're gonna crack free our lug nuts with a breaker bar or you use a lug nut wrench. Make sure you got the right socket for your lug nuts and while you're at it, grab a torque wrench so that when we're done this job, we can actually torque them up so they won't come loose on us. Now, once the vehicle is lifted up off the ground, we have to take off a dust cap, so uh, screwdrivers, flat screwdrivers and a hammer so we can get that off. And then once you got access to the cotter pin, you're gonna need a pair of needle nose pliers and a pair of vice grips to yank that out. You're going to need a crescent wrench or a rather large socket and a socket wrench to be able to take off the castle nut. Once you get your hub off, it's gonna need some cleaning up, especially around the threads and where the hub sits on the wheel. So a wire brush would be a good tool to have. And then before we inspect the bearings, we're gonna have to have some stuff for cleaning up. So get yourself a bunch of paper towel or some rags. It is a messy job, so make sure you have enough some brake cleaner so we can really clean the surface as well and make sure there's no grease or fingerprints on our brake components before we put everything back together. You are going to need some new uh, high pressure, high temperature wheel bearing grease, so get a tub of that. And we are going to need new seals so that we have no issues going forward with a old seal being reused and leaking. You're also gonna need a set of cotter pins or really only one per side of matching size for the cotter pin you remove. And uh, other useful tools are a bearing seal driver kit. These are great at installing inner and outer bearing races and the seals. And if you can't afford that, you can always kind of try to find things around the shop, like little pipes and, and things like that, that you can use to drive the components in without damaging them. And then in my case, since I'm in there, I'm gonna be checking my brakes. So I've got a brake drum caliper. I'm gonna use that to be able to check my settings before I close it all up. All right, those are all the tools. So let's get this thing jacked up and ready to go. So I'm doing the left side of this trailer now. So I'm gonna go put the chocks on the right side or the tires that are staying on the ground so this doesn't roll away while I'm working. Now in this case, the lug nuts have a cover on them just to keep them looking a little better. So just pull those off. Sometimes they might actually have a separate thread and you have to unscrew them, but in this case, they just pull off. Now, if I'm using manual tools, you're gonna wanna crack free these lug nuts while the tire's on the ground. That way you don't have this whole thing trying to spin and trying to stop it from moving in the air. When you go to do this, make sure you undo a star pattern. And if you can't use your arms to muscle this going counterclockwise, why don't you stand on it, use your weight to your advantage. Just put your foot on it, like that. Make sure you undo and star pattern. And we don't want these fully undone, we just want them cracked free. Now, if this was a car or a truck, you would lift it and put your safety stands exactly where they need to be. If you're not sure, I'll post a link to a video that I made uh, to show you exactly where to put it and be safe. Now, because this is a tent trailer, the frame's a little bit more flimsy, and so we don't really wanna jack up and put jack stands around the perimeter frame because it can actually warp this thing and have all kinds of issues. However, the axle is designed where it's mounted to support the weight of the vehicle. So what we're gonna do is jack up one side of the axle and one tire off the ground and put a safety stand next to it and not keeping the other tire on the ground. So let's go do that. So you can see I've lifted up with the jack underneath the center of that axle. This end is off the ground. That one is chalked over there so this isn't moving. And I've got a safety stand there. I'm not gonna put it down on there. I'm gonna leave this jack in there and that way it's uh, supported if it needs it. Now one thing, watch that you don't uh, lift or damage any wires under here. So for some reason, the electric trailer brakes wires are there and so it can be very easily pinched 
when you do this job, and if you do that, you're gonna have breaks, so that could be pretty dangerous. So watch that. At this point, we gotta remove these lug nuts. If you got an impact gun, use it. I'm just gonna do this manually because a lot of you don't actually have things like that. So I'll show you the job can still be done without these fancy tools. Right, not a bad idea as you do the job, kind of collect and gather stuff rather than have it all just sitting here in a mess and easy to kick a nut and lose it over the, across the shop and never to be found again. And take your wheel off. Next job is to take out this dust cap. Now its job is just to keep the salt and water and grime and water from getting into our bearings. So get yourself a flat screwdriver and get in between the two parts and just to pry it and try not to get it cocked where it's at an angle. So get a little bit loose here, go to the opposite side and just work it out evenly. And I'm noticing that this one doesn't have a lip, meaning that it's inside there. So this isn't actually how this one's gonna come off. So if it's got a lip, you can do the hammering method. If it doesn't, and it looks like it's going straight in, then that's what it's doing. So at this point, we need a pair of water pump pliers so we can grab this and kind of pull and twist at the same time to get this to come out. Like that. Now at this point, to make it a little bit of a cleaner job, plus we can see what we're doing, we gotta get some of this grease off. So get a rag, try to scoop off as much of this stuff as you can. There's only so much you can get off, so just do your best. Now I can see my cotter pin here. So the way the cotter pin works is it goes through the shaft, through a hole, through one of the little slots here in the castle nut, and once it's through, you take one of the ends and you splay it out like that so it doesn't want to come out. And that pin prevents the castle nut from backing out. So to get this off, you bend the tab straight, straight as you can. And then you grab this end with a pair of pliers or vice grips and then basically yank it out. If it's super tight and rusted, you may have to get a little pin punch to help it through. Now that's easy, it broke right there. This one shouldn't be too bad. I can see it moving already. There you go, there's the cotter pin out. So now we can get this castle nut off. Now this ends up being, uh, for mine anyways, an inch and a half castle nut. And I actually don't have that socket on hand. So I'm gonna grab a crescent wrench and uh, see if I can undo this myself. Now it shouldn't be crazy tight. So you should be able to just hold the hub and undo it. Worst case scenario, you can always just put the wheel back on, put a couple lug nuts in. Uh, put a wedge under the tire and lock it for moving so you can undo it. Yeah, there you go. It shouldn't be that tight. We'll talk about that in a bit. So take the old castle nut off. And underneath this castle nut should be a washer. That's interesting. It's like one of the first times I've ever seen this. There's almost always a spindle washer. Sometimes it stays put with a little uh, keyway groove in the shaft. Sometimes it can be a, a little bit bigger spindle washer that has little tabs on it and you hammer it around the castle nut. But in this case, there actually isn't one. Uh, so I may put a very thin spindle washer just so that the nut is not wearing on this outer bearing. Now at this point, you can take this whole hub and the bearings and everything off and start the cleanup. Your fingers are getting greasy already. When you get this hub off, inside is brake components. You got shoes and the inside of the drum. Try not to put your fingers on them. We're gonna clean it really good before we put it together, but just uh, try not to make more mess that you have to clean up after. All right, so now you can see the spindle shaft here and you can start to see the brake components for this vehicle, which happens to have electric brakes. We're not gonna get too far into this, but we will inspect that before we put it together. Now, first thing, I want the old grease and all the dirt and grind off. So I'll just do a good job cleaning this. Now, I don't know the next time I'm actually gonna have electric brakes to show you, so I'll talk a little bit about it, but I'm not gonna go too in depth with brakes. Uh, that's some up and coming stuff for the channel, and we'll get into that a little bit more. So this brake system is an electric brake system. It's using a drum brake style. So we have two brake shoes here with a lining that starts to wear out here, so we can check that. For my reference, I would want at least a millimeter from the backing plate out on the friction material or about 1 16th. Anything less than that, they're, they're due for a change. And 
they can tend to have different thicknesses. So what I'm gonna do is just take a look and see which is the skinniest spot there. And if it's more than one millimeter, we're good. And just make a note of it for a rough idea of when the brakes need to be changed. Now, other things you're looking for in here is there rust, cobwebs, rusty springs, things like that. Otherwise, it just looks a little bit of brake dust on it, so it looks okay. Um, if I find that the measurements are different from the other side, then that might involve having to play with the star wheel adjuster, take it apart, get it lubed up and working properly, and set them both evenly. Otherwise, when you hit the brakes, you might have one bra grab harder or earlier than the other side, which can cause the trailer to pull. Now, the cool thing about electric brakes is we've got a little magnet here, a little electromagnet. So when you hit the brake pedal on your car, the brake controller sends a certain amount of voltage, which makes a electromagnet a certain strength. And this part right here sucks against the side of the brake drum. And when it does that, depending on the way this is spinning, it actually starts to move the components. So in this case, the drum would spin this way, so the magnet will want to go this way and it moves this arm and you can see how the shoes are extending out. So it's kind of like an exaggerated emergency part braking setup, except it's using an electromagnet to guide how strong that braking is. Now for these guys, there's four little dots in here. If you can't see the dots or they're very, very shallow holes, that's time for a change for this electromagnet. But I can see them, they're pretty deep, a couple millimeter each, so this should be good. And uh, like I said, as long as I got about a millimeter on here, the brake should be good on this and good to go. Now to make sure this brake drum's okay, basically take a look at this shiny surface in here and on the side edge, see if there's any heat discoloration, you know, blues and purple colors, uh, any rust, any cracking, any issues like that. If it looks okay, then we just have to be concerned about what this diameter is and if it's worn out too big. So to measure this, you really do need one of these. It's a brake drum caliper and you loosen it here and we're going to measure with these two inside. And when you do this, you have to kind of get it to roughly where you think the center of this is and make sure that it's parallel. And so when I'm pulling out, I kind of pinch right here to keep the tension on it. And then when I think I've got it good, I lock it and then take it out. And on this one in particular, there's a white piece of plastic here. You just read what it's saying here. And in this case, I don't know if you could see that or not, it's about seven, just under seven inches. Now, to figure out if this is good or bad for this, there's two things you can do. Roughly, there's a chamfer or an angle machined in here. And from one side to the other, that is the maximum diameter this drum can be before it has to be replaced. So we're nowhere near that, so this should be good. And then if I flip it over, they almost always have a dimensions uh, cast into the casting here to tell you when it is no good or when it has to be replaced. So for example, this one says max diameter 7.060 inches. So we got lots of room with us being only seven inches. So that is good for us. Now, the cool thing about these brake drum calipers is we just measured the internal diameter of our drum. And what it actually does is this tool now sets the outside diameter of this caliper surface to the exact dimension of what we just measured in internally. So what we can do is we can use this now and go over the brake shoes and take a look at what the difference or clearance is between these. And uh, we're shooting for about a millimeter, no less, no bigger. If it's too big, it takes longer for the brake shoe to hit the drum and start the braking. If it's too close, you can have issues where just that touch, a little bit of friction as this is rolling down the road can cause things to heat up and then have these seize on you. So we want one millimeter and it's pretty much bang on one mil and it's the same as the other side. So we should have no issues with this trailer pulling. Now I'm taking a look at this surface here. I was thinking I would go grab a metric uh, ruler to measure that. I can tell I'm nowhere near one mil. It's closer to four mil, three mil. So I've got years of braking left on this, so that'll be good as well. In order to inspect these bearings, we're gonna have to clean all the grease out so that we can see what we're doing. So let's do that. So this is your outer bearing. Just get as much of the old grease off as possible. And like I said, you're gonna be going through a bunch of rags here. I like personally trying to get as much of the old grease and the old dirt and corrosion and anything that's building up in there out. There's that bearing. And then you can see down in there, there's a ton of grease. Now the grease actually doesn't look that bad, but like I said, I don't like leaving this in. I have no idea how long this is. The, the guy that 
uh, owns the trailer said that it's been in here for about five years. It could be even longer than that. So just a better idea just to get rid of it all. That way we can put in fresh stuff and we know what's going on with this car. That's pretty good. We'll give one final wipe here just to the top so we can actually take a look at this outer race. Or sorry, yeah, the outer race here and see if there's any issues with it. So this is your outer bearing and this is the outer race for the bearing. And I'll try to turn this here so you guys can see. So this surface right here, this angled tapered surface, what you need to look for is any kind of rust, corrosion, pitting, cracking, uh, color like blue and purple for heat discoloration. And if you don't see anything in there and it looks smooth and you don't feel any kind of bumps in there, then um, this bearing outer race is good to use. So uh, this one looks okay. Now when you get to the inner side, you can't actually get at the bearing in the race yet because we have a seal, a bearing seal there that's keeping all the grease trapped and not getting out of here into our brakes and having issues that way. So we gotta take this bearing seal out. Now, there's a couple ways of doing this. Uh, one tool I forgot to mention is this guy here. This is a bearing seal remover, and it's got a nice little pick in there that gets right underneath, and you just lever it, and you can go like this, and same idea, you don't wanna kinda angle it because it can get kinda cocked and hard to get out. So just do one side at a time, and just go like this and pry it out. Keep in mind though, this is not gentle to the seal, so you are damaging that seal, and you have to replace it. Now. I tend to replace these bearing seals anyway every single time I do this, so once a year kind of thing. You're looking at 10 to 15 bucks and it's um, a good security for the future that you don't have grease coming out into your brakes. So for 15 bucks I think it's a valuable thing to do. So you can use that. The other thing you can do if you don't have that tool is from this side, hunt around the shop and see if you can find a big socket, a piece of pipe, something that has the same size as just enough to get down in there to sit right on top of the bearing and then with a light tap with a hammer you can kind of just tap the bearing seal through now when i say lightly tap the reason why is if you're having to uh, hit this really hard with a hammer to get that bearing seal to pop out chances are you're going to be damaging that bearing in the back so if if you if i were you i would just do the bearing seal remover tool uh, that way you don't have any issues there you go now i'm going to clean this up because i want later to be able to show you how to identify these parts so you can figure out what you actually have to put into your trailer or into your car uh, because often it can be hard to find this info online so it's better if you can read the info on this. And in this case, it's right in here on the rubber. It's kind of cast into the rubber surface. So you really got to clean it up. It's probably not even going to be visible for you guys. So it's more uh, me telling you about it. So clean this up till you can get some numbers on here. And for me, it says GS-125ODL. And over here it says TRP. So you take that info, go Google it online, and then you'll be able to find replacement parts. Now, if you're having, still having trouble, not a direct match, you can take this to your local auto parts store and bring a digital vernier caliper and you can measure the OD. So that has to match so it fits that hole. Uh, the thickness should match. So in this case, I think it's about a quarter inch. And then this diameter here, very gently measure the lips of the rubber and get that diameter. And if you have that info, you should be able to get this part, no problem. All right, now here is our inner bearing. Clean it up so we can give it an inspection as well. And same thing, once you clean it all off, on this surface here will be the identifying numbers so that if you need to replace the bearing, uh, you can get that with those numbers as well. Same deal as before, you take a look at this tapered surface of this outer bearing race and uh, take a look for corrosion pitting. I don't see any, so this is gonna be uh, a good part to reuse as well. So the only thing left to do here is clean up the bearings and inspect them. So I'm looking at the bearing surfaces, the inner here. I'm looking at the cage, which is the thin sheet metal piece that holds all of these roller bearings. You can spin the roller bearings and what you're looking for is rust corrosion, damage to the cage, any pitting, any discoloration, and uh, this thing's looking great. So this is good for a, another six months or a year until the next inspection. Now, 
if this was showing signs of needing fixing or replacing, you can look at the back side here. And so this one here, I don't know if you can read it. And if I go closer, it's going to go fuzzy. So I'll just read it. It says uh, LSA, Slovakia. Hey, fellow Slovaks. Ahoy. Ako samash. And then right here, we've got L44649. So you take this number to your Lordco or your Napa and you'll be able to get a full complete bearing race uh, for this. Now, important to note, you don't just take the new one of these out of the package and put it in with the old races. You do need to knock those out. Uh, I'm not going to show you that in this video because we're just inspecting them and these are good. But a future video, I will show you how to change out those uh, outer bearing races if you have to replace the bearing. Now. Something interesting to note, because this didn't have a spindle washer like it should, there's two bearings here, and they look the same, ID, OD, everything. I can't read this surface because that castle nut was on that surface. So even if that spindle washer um, was there, it would have probably prevented that, and I could have read what the details are. Now, uh, I did the other side of this already, and when I looked at it, it literally did say the same. I had a really hard time reading it, but once I could read the other one, and the fact that this side's the exact same, all four uh, inner outer for both sides are the same exact bearings. And um, not a bad idea if you're doing this every year with your trailer, write down these numbers that we don't actually have to do this, get to this point just to know what you need for your vehicle. You know, make a note, write it down. So uh, the other bearing here, looks just as good no corrosion no pitting no damage to the cage so these are good bearings and all we got to do is clean them up a little bit further and uh, repack them and i'll show you how to do that now i like to really clean these out uh, if you have you know a little bit of kerosene and a little kind of metal container and a brush you can take some time and kind of just get all the grease out uh, i don't want to bother doing that so i've got some brake and parts cleaner here just give it a little bit soak and then wipe up, up the excess and let it evaporate out uh, and then uh, that way you know all the grease and dirt is out of these things for sure So we've inspected these bearings and they are good to go, but we now have to pack them with some new grease. Now you got a couple options here. You can get these little bearing packing tools. I really don't like them. Uh, first off, if you need to pack a bearing and you don't have this, then what are you gonna do, right? And you don't know how to do it. So uh, I don't, I'm not gonna show you how to use this. You can go buy one and learn, read the instruction manuals on the box for it. Uh, but this guy here, we're gonna do a hand pack bearing. And I'm gonna show you how to do that. Okay, so first thing we need is some good quality wheel bearing grease. So get yourself a tub of this. And uh, really, the bigger the tub, the cheaper it is. However, you end up with a 20 gallon bucket of goo that's 50 years old. So I would stick to no bigger than something about hand size. That way at least you can use it in your lifetime. Now, take your bearing. You need to get dirty at this point. Now you can put gloves on if you want, but I don't do this that often, so I'm not too concerned. Give yourself a good dollop of it and stick it in the palm of your hand. Maybe a touch more actually, like that. Okay, then you take your bearing and because these are not brand new bearings, there's some red grease in here. As we do the hand packing here, you're gonna see that green grease is gonna come up and the red grease is gonna come out. If it's a brand new bearing, you're gonna keep doing this until you see brand new green grease coming out. Now how you do it is you kinda of just push it down into your palm and then swipe push and swipe and you just keep repeating that just taking little bites of this this dollop of grease until you see green coming out uh, right there in that gr uh, crack i'm gonna try to get as good of a view as i can you can see the red grease coming out and we're pushing out the old and in comes the new And you can just start to see green grease coming out. So that, you know, one quarter of the bearing is good. So now you just kind of rotate it. And if you need to put some more grease on, you go ahead and do that. And then you just keep going until you got that green grease coming out in the new section. Once again, you can see the red grease getting squished out, getting hydraulically squished out. And if you run out, no biggie, just once again, put some more in there. You might find there's a lot sticking on the side here. And just keep taking little bites. And I'm not gonna do the whole entire bearing. You just keep repeating this process till you have nice clean green grease squeezed out up through that top surface 
all the way along the entire bearing. So once you see it coming out like that, all the way around, give yourself another kind of just smooth out. You take off all the excess here so we're not dropping it and gooping it everywhere. Give the outside a coating. Like that and then this is ready to go and we got the other one to do now not a bad idea because we have our brake drum and the surface in there for the electric brakes that we can't have any grease on it now that we've got all the grease cleaned up somewhat uh, brakes and parts cleaner let's give it a spray make sure that absolutely clean and then from here on do not put your fingers on any of the surfaces Time to start assembling here. So we're gonna put a little bit of grease here right on the actual outer race. And then I like putting a little bit past in there. So kind of like there's a little bit of a reserve and that's all the stuff we kind of saw that we were having to take out extra from before. Just on the back edge there. So if it needs it, it kind of will stick to the spinning bearing and get in there. And then you take the bearing, in this case it doesn't matter which one, put it down in there. And then to trap this thing, we have to put back in our bearing seal. So here's our new fully matched up with the old one here. And we're gonna put this down in here. And when we go to install this, the trick is we want it to go down flat. If it goes crooked, we're gonna end up smashing this bearing seal up and having a hard time. So try to go straight. If it starts to get crooked, hit the high side only to get it to straighten out before you start punching it back down. Here we have our bearing race and seal driver kit. Uh, if you need one of these, go ahead and pick one up. You will use it again. These are a lifesaver and they make the job so much easier to do. So what you do, if you are doing a bearing seal installation, you want to grab one of these pucks that the flat side fits the best to that shape. If you're doing a bearing race install, you can see that these have tapers on them and that's for that side to install the races. Now, this is the one I want. So take the installer tool, put it on like this, and then there's a little screw that you tighten up to hold this in place. And then you hit here with a hammer as you drive the seal with this. All right, so I'll fit this in. There we go. This side's a little touch high, so I'm gonna make sure that I hit on that side first. And that kind of went to the other. Like I said, just go from the high side. Just doing little tippy taps. We're not driving this in with a sledgehammer. Make sure you get straight. And once you got it in straight, then it'll kind of guide itself. There we go. Now I would say at least flush with the surface there where the angle goes down into it. Uh, you can go a little bit lower, but I would not definitely drive it right against the bearing. That way the spinning part is not touching the seal at all. Right, now that that side's done, flip this over and kind of repeat the per process a little bit. So a little bit of grease in the inside on that outer race. kind of extra just past it kind of sitting on the inside lip there that way if it needs it it's got it for the most part this grease is going to stay put because it's got something called tackifiers in it that make it basically stick and it's the same stuff that when you go to wash your hands it feels oily for a long time that's the tackifiers doing their job not wanting to leave the surface okay and then the last bearing Put it, put a little bit more bearing grease around it. And then this part is ready to go on. Now before we put this on, in the interest of making sure everything goes together smoothly and no issues and the lug nuts go down fine and the wheel sits against this hub flush, we're gonna take a wire brush and just clean up any of the rust and scale that's been growing on this for who knows how long.
Now important to note, don't put any kind of any seize or never seize on these bolts or any of these surfaces. Uh, the torque spec for these lug nuts is meant to be dry, so do not put anything on there. Uh, that's why we're just cleaning them up with the wires. So we have no issues. Now before we slide the hub back on, we're going to want to lube up this shaft here. So a little bit of wheel bearing grease. And if you look at where the shiny machined part is, I would not go any further with the grease. That way you don't run the risk of having any of this grease dripping into your brake components, interfering with your brakes. All right, before you slide the drum back on, make sure everything's in the right spots here. So for example, make sure the spring is on the little pin on this arm and the electromagnet is going to sit in its place where it's supposed to. Make sure this wire is not getting pinched or anything like that so you don't have any issues. All right, S carefully slide this on because you do have that very thin rubber seal. You don't want to just throw it on and accidentally gouge it. So I wasn't happy how this didn't have a spindle washer to begin with. So I went to my auto parts store and I got a very, very thin spindle washer that fits this. At this point, we're going to put on our castle nut. Make sure it doesn't go on crooked. Just use your hand. And then take your socket or your crescent wrench and we have to seat the bearings. We're making sure that this thing is all centered and we can't do that by just tightening it. We actually have to kind of spin it and while it's spinning, give it a tighten. That's what's going to help center everything. So get this set up and kind of find where it's going to be kind of starting to get snug. And that way you can back off a bit. And then what you do is you give the drum a spin and as it's spinning, just come down with this about 50 foot pounds of strength, you know, kind of choke up on the handle and, um, that's what's going to seat the bearings. I do this a couple times and then my final one, I'll show you what I do. So like this. Okay. It's once, twice, three times, and then I'll do one more with the last. All right. Now this is too tight the way it is. It kind of stops spinning early. So, I want to back this off a little bit and the amount you need is you take a look at for where your the cotter pin hole is and right now it's actually wanting to go right where this part of the castle nut is and so if I back it off about a sixteenth of a turn that hole is going to line up right there and uh, that'll work for me. Okay, take a brand new cotter pin. Now, because it's kind of has to come in at a weird angle, I've kind of pre-bent this a little bit, but do not use your old cotter pin. Throw it out, put a new one in. There we go. And you might need a pair of pliers to kind of help push this through. Yeah, that's good. And then the very ends here, you're gonna splay them over, one to one side, one to the other. That way this does not come out. There we go. And just make sure that you're not going to interfere with where the dust cap has to fit. That should be good like that. Now, when you've got this set, you should give it a little spin. Should spin nice and should be no play. If there's a lot of play, then you've got it backed off too far. And uh, if you have no play and you go to spin it and it kind of just stops really quickly, then that's a sign that you have this too tight. Okay, I'm happy with that. Now I've got some exposed threads here on the end of this spindle shaft. Uh, it doesn't hurt to just put a little bit of extra wheel bearing grease in there just to kind of prevent any rust and any issues later. You don't need a ton in there kind of some extra and really if the bearing ever needs it it's there as well. Now when I go to put this dust cap back in if I just take a hammer to it I'm going to end up caving it in so find yourself a flat piece of wood or something flat that you can kind of spread the, the impact force out a little bit so that way you're not caving this thing in. Next up is putting our wheel. Make sure you got the valve stem facing out. And 
then, good rule of thumb for any nuts and bolts you're putting together, always start them by hand. That way you know if there's gonna be any issues, you got the wrong bolt, you know, it's a metric bolt and you're using an imperial nut on it. That's why I always start things by hand now. Go three, four turns and then you know there's absolutely no issues. Big thing, these style of stud lug nuts, there's a taper on them. Make sure the taper goes towards the hub. That's what centers it. If you put it the other way, it will have balance issues for sure. Snug these lug nuts up with a socket wrench or your lug nut wrench as hard as you can up here with it, the tire up in the air. And then we'll have to throw a wheel chalk in here or lower the tire down till it just touches to stop this from moving for our final torque. Now for the final torque of these wheels, you're gonna need a torque wrench and you're gonna to have to set it appropriately for what you're working on. For this vehicle, it wants 80 foot-pounds and it also wants you to check them in 10 miles, 20 miles, and then 50 miles from now and every 50 miles after, uh, just to make sure these are not loosening up and you have any issues that way. Now, when I go to tighten this, I am gonna have this thing spin, so I need some way of stopping it. So if you have an extra wheel chalk, you can always just throw that underneath the tire. That'll stop it from spinning. Or if you don't have that, you can slowly lower the jack until the tire just touches the ground and that should be enough to keep it from moving so you can final torque it. Star pattern so we don't warp our parts. Listen for the click. When you got it set properly, when the click is heard, that's when you need to stop. All right, I've done all of them in the star pattern, but I, I highly recommend that you go around now in a circular pattern just to double check that nothing's loosened up or you haven't missed one. Take this chalk out. Now, before we lower this down and call it a day, remember that I wanted to check if there's any bearing play in here. So grab the left and right tire, side of the tire, and give it a quick little jerk in and out, and there should be no play. Now, I'm sensing the smallest amount of play. It's very minor. And uh, up and down, I'll probably feel a little bit too. I'm okay with that. It's just it's the slightest amount of play. And even if you felt no play, that might be okay too, as long as it's not too tight on that cast nut. One final thing, don't forget your little protective cosmetic caps. And they just push on. All right, cool, job's all done. So at this point, we just gotta jack up the tent trailer, take out the safety stand, slowly lower it down to the ground, and take out our wheel chocks. Now, when you go to drive this tent trailer away, the manufacturer specifies right on the rim that you should be checking the torque or the tightness of these lug nuts in the first 10 miles, and then check it again at 20 miles, and then at 50 miles, and then every 50 miles after. Now, because we just did the bearings and we adjusted the play in there, when you go to check those, you've had some highway miles on there, go and put your hand right on the hub and it should feel cold. If it has any heat to it or really hot to the touch, that's telling you right now that that bearing is too tight, too much friction, and it's causing heat. So if you find that's the problem, you're gonna have to get this jacked up, take the wheel off again, and I would readjust that play. You're gonna have to back it off just a touch more, maybe even just one other notch on that castle nut and put a new cotter pin in. Whoo! There's another video from Way of the Wrench, and that by far was the dirtiest and greasiest video to try to film and not get my camera gear all gross for you guys, but hopefully you were able to get something out of it, and now you know how to inspect and and repack your wheel bearings. How cool is that? Uh, if you have any questions or concerns about the video, feel free to comment down below and I will get back to you as soon as possible. And if you haven't already, I'd really appreciate a like and a subscribe and maybe even a share out on your social media if you deem me worthy. Uh, until next time, take it easy.